What's cracking, everybody? Welcome back to the HQ. Welcome back to the channel. My name is Nicholas, and I am representing Big Dogs Got the BDGE Fantasy Football. We're going to do this episode standing up. This is the first time I did this. Actually, I think I did it once with uh, when I interviewed Matt Harmon from Yahoo, but I'm feeling good. I feel like there's going to be a lot of energy coming out of me today because I am standing up. A lot of room for me to do helicopters and shit. And I know a lot of people always comment on my like my hand gestures, so now I don't have to like hit the table when I move. And plus, I got hell of room to do my Millie Rocks. We're getting into some 2019 fantasy football. Some guys that are going, you know, later in your drafts, eighth, ninth, double digit rounds that I think have legit league winning upside. So call them sleepers, call them breakout candidates. They are what they are. It is what it is. 2019 fantasy football, late round picks with league winning upside. I love y'all. If you enjoy the video, make sure you hit that thumbs up button. Make sure you subscribe to the channel if you're new. We're doing everything 2019 fantasy football forever and ever and ever. Even in 2021, we're doing 2019 fantasy football. Let's get it. First guy up on this list, and I actually want to see if you can guess it before I even say his name. He's currently going around pick 80 to 90. He's a running back, early 30s, mid 30s. I want to see if you can guess it from the tweet I put out. Make sure you're following me, Nick underscore BDGE. Someone got it within like two minutes. I was, I was freaking pissed. This guy has been playing in the NFL for five years. He is a relatively good pass catcher and he is going to be relevant this year. 162 career targets, 128 receptions, 882 receiving yards, has yet to score a receiving touchdown. 128 receptions, hasn't got in the end zone yet. He's like fucking Jarvis Landry on steroids. So, I'm gonna give you like five to seven seconds to go drop a comment down below. Guess who it is. If you do that for me, I will respond to everyone who guesses and I will answer any question you want fantasy-wise. So drop the guess, and then you are free to ask away any personal fantasy question that you want. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. All right. So we have Latavius Murray of the newly acquired New Orleans Saints. I really believe that Latavius Murray is going to go down as one of the sneaky best picks of the fantasy football season uh, in 2019. He comes over from Minnesota, right? He was a free agent. He signs with the Saints four years, $14.4 million. So a nice lucrative contract. The way it's set up is Murray will be, without a doubt, with the team through... Um, 2020 and then there's a potential opt-out as you can see here and this is from spotrack.com s-p-o-t-r-a-c.com it's the best resource you can go for any sports contracts nfl nba whatever um so he's on the team he's gonna be a big part of the team for at least the next two years we have mark ingram moving over to baltimore so you have to ask yourself simply does latavius murray fit right into what mark ingram's role was so we look at who they were as players, right? Both can contribute on all three downs. Both can run in between the tackles. Both can run outside. Both can uh, pass block and both can catch passes. They have that three down skill set, both of them. So it seems to check all the boxes. We have Latavius Murray filling in for who Mark Ingram was on the Saints, right? Both are 215 pounds plus. They're both thick backs and both are great at scoring. Both are great on the goal line. Over the last four seasons, Latavius Murray has averaged 0.52 rushing touchdowns per game. Mark Ingram... Same span, 0.54 rushing touchdowns per game. Latavius Murray moving from the situation in Minnesota probably would have been a super easy fade this year in fantasy had he not gone to the Saints. Yeah, any other team besides the Saints, and he would have been an easy fade this year in fantasy. But here we are. And now, Murray walks into a situation where not only does he have this Mark Ingram-type standalone value for fantasy, but he is the undisputed best handcuff this year in fantasy football. He's probably going to score between seven and eight rushing touchdowns, and maybe we finally see him score a receiving touchdown, right? 128 receptions without a receiving touchdown. I would assume that eventually that has to go up. So what happens if Kamara gets hurt, right? And, you know, he's he's been very durable. He hasn't done anything that would make me think that that would happen, but the running back position is, you know, a very strenuous position. Injuries happen there a lot. So if Kamara goes down, Latavius Murray pretty much becomes a, a top 12 no-brainer pick in fantasy. But he also has that standalone value, which is what makes him so so intriguing as a fantasy pick. Like normally, right, Mark Ingram, Mark Ingram last year was like a sixth round pick, knowing that he had the four-game suspension going into the season. And now Latavius Murray in the same role, without being suspended, is going as like an eighth, ninth, 
or even later round pick. And I think he's someone that's going to go later and later in like family and friend leagues. In sharper leagues, he's uh, going a little bit earlier. And I think he's honestly a great buy in Dynasty because you think of him as an older player. You're like, ah, he's probably done. But he's going to have two really solid years with the Saints right now. Um, and I think those those years alone, if you kind of fade running backs early, are going to be able to supplement you for the next couple of years. And you'll probably be able to start him in your like RB2 or flex spot. So I love Latavius Murray in Dynasty Leagues right now too. When you look at Murray, who he is as a runner and why I think he's going to be so effective in New Orleans, right? He's a big back. Like I said, like 6'2", 220, 225 pounds, but he runs very fast. He has a, a 4 4 3 40, so that puts him in like elite weight adjusted speed score percentile, right? And he has the home run speed. It's something that we saw early on in his career, right? He broke a 90 yard run uh, back in Oakland, but when he was playing in Minnesota, right, you're looking at that offensive line and they don't open up enough holes for him to put that home run um, speed ability like on display. Now he's going to New Orleans, who have been absolutely elite in the run blocking sense. Looking at football outsiders, there's not a lot of good resources to find um, offensive line rankings, at least for free. The best one I could give to you guys is the footballoutsiders.com. They have New Orleans as the first overall run blocking line, second, and then second over the last three years. Those are their rankings in terms of run blocking line. So don't be surprised when Murray comes in here, gets tons of goal line carries, tons of 10 zone carries, and also breaks off multiple 40 plus yard rushing touchdowns. He just needs those holes and give him that and he's gone. When you look at how involved Ingram has been on the goal line, I know Kamar is amazing on the goal line too, and they're going to give him plenty of carries and touches within the 10 yard line and on the goal line. But Ingram has had 25 goal line carries over the last two years and 40 carries within the 10 yard line. 40 carries within the 10 yard line over the last two years. And he also missed four games last year. Like you look at Ingram's numbers, his per game numbers since Kamara has come onto the, you know, come onto the backfield in New Orleans, he's getting nearly a goal line carry a game, 1.4 10 zone. When I say 10 zone, I mean inside the 10 yard line of the opponent, 1.4 10 zone carries a game, 16 touches and 0.68 overall touchdown. Those are on average. That's not games where Kamara's out. That's not games dating back to before Kamara came. Those are with Kamara in the backfield. So to think Latavius Murray, after getting this lucrative contract, is not gonna put up similar numbers to Mark Ingram, I think would be kind of naive. And to get those numbers, get 16 touches plus a goal line carry per game, which is almost a coin flip to score a touchdown almost every game, you know, he adds on a receiving touchdown. Murray is going to be like a phenomenal late round pick this year in fantasy. And like I said, the reason he's on this list is because these are later picks with league winning upside. Again, if something happens to Kamara, Latavius Murray becomes an R a no doubter RB1 week in and week out. He did it multiple times with the Vikings last year while still splitting snaps and stuff with other running backs. But if, if this happens and, you know, Kamara does go down, Latavius Murray is an RB1 for you that could be a league winner. Like, Ingram was good, don't get me wrong. And I don't want to say he's a replacement level back, because I think he's above average in that sense, but neither is Latavius Murray. R Latavius Murray is not just a replacement level back either. He offers nearly the same skill set. So is there going to be a big drop-off from Ingram to Latavius Murray? I don't personally think so. So that's the big facts I got on Latavius Murray for you. Uh, as you may or may not know, I put together a draft kit, a draft guide for you guys every summer, the Big Dogs Draft Guide, that releases on July 1st. Uh, you can go cop it now, bigdogsdraftguide.com. That's a way to support me and support all the content that I put out. It's got everything you need for your 2019 season. If you think these videos are informative, that draft guide will blow you away. But I also want to do a giveaway for the draft guide. I'm going to give away three draft guides. Fuck it. I'm going to give away the rookie and the season-long draft guide, which is a retail value. This is just what CNN told me. Fox News told me this is the retail value. I don't make it. They tell me what it is. $49.99. I thought it was high. I was like, damn, you guys value my draft guide that high. That's why I put it at that price. You're going to get both draft guides. What I want you to do is go on iTunes and review the podcast. Throw a five star. Fuck it. You can throw a one star if you want to. I don't care what it is. Just give it a review, please. And I want to see a screenshot of the review. You could send that to me. I don't care if you send it via email, Twitter DM, Instagram DM, Facebook DM, whatever it is. Actually, don't do Facebook DM because I don't really check that. Send me the screenshot of you reviewing it and you will automatically be entered. If you've already done that, you will automatically be entered as well. And if you've bought the draft guide already, I will refund you the money for it. I'll take money out of my pocket and give it back to you. So I'm gonna give away three draft guides, go on iTunes, find the podcast, which will be linked down below in the description anyways. If you're like, oh, I don't have an iPhone, iTunes, steal your, steal your mom's phone, steal your girlfriend's phone, 
and write a review from their phone. All right, that's how we're doing it. iTunes podcast review. You're entered into a draft guide giveaway. I will do that probably at the end of June or something. Um, so let's get back into league winning upside guys. Second guy on this list is another running back, Justice Hill. Running back for the Baltimore Ravens, their fourth round rookie pick this year. He's currently going off the board around 150th overall, running back 52. So he's really, 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 really late round. And while we're talking about how Mark Ingram's probably not a replaceable level player, let's talk about his immediate competition this year. I mean, it might be Gus Edwards, but we know Gus Edwards has absolutely no versatility to his game. Uh, Kenneth Dixon wouldn't be surprised if he got cut, given the fact that Justice Hill is now on the roster. And look, I get it. Ingram is a good pass catcher, but the Ravens are very likely to use the much more explosive Justice Hill in pass catching situations on third downs. When you get a guy like Justice Hill on the field, on third downs, in pass catching situations, all that is, is opportunity. When you put a guy that's a playmaker like Justice Hill on the field, he's going to make plays. When you do that on limited samples, right, in limited size of opportunities, that leads to more opportunities. So you give the guy six touches, eight touches, and he breaks away a 40-yard run, you got, you, you know, you say to yourself, okay, we need to continue to get him on the field. Let's get him on the field on first downs, on second downs. And that is how one slowly takes over the backfield. When you look at Justice Hill's numbers, man, he had the fastest 40-yard time of any running back at the combine this year with a flat 4-4-0, 97th percentile. Even at his size of 5'10", 198, that's in the 81st percentile. I am shocked he fell out of the third round this year to the fourth round. Because not only did he test amongst the best backs in the uh, at the combine, but he also produced at an extremely high level in college. Right, right out of the gates, freshman year, not a red shirt, raw freshman year, 1,200 yards from scrimmage. That's while Chris Carson of the Seattle Seahawks was in the backfield with Justice Hill. The next year, his sophomore year, 300 touches, 1,650 yards from scrimmage, including 31 receptions. So we know he's a good pass catcher. 16 touchdowns. So you rarely have a guy that one, tests really well to combine, and two, produces at a high level in college. The, his third year in college, he dealt with a lot of injuries, so his numbers went down. But when you look at he did, what he did his freshman year and sophomore year, it, it, that's what Justice Hill is in a running back. Um, it, it's very rare that you see a guy fall into the fourth round. So I think the Ravens got an absolute steal, uh, steal here. I think Hill is going to be a beast and he will excel into like a 10 to 15 touch roll. So I'm not saying here, you know, he's 5'10", 198 pounds. Uh, he won't be the workhorse here. But as you can see on player profiler, his best comparable player was like Reggie Bush. I think he reminds me a lot of uh, a Marlon Mack as well. Someone who's super underrated within the tackles. And he looks more like a lean athlete, right? He's got like long limbs and he kind of looks like a wide receiver or a weapon more than a running back, but he's super explosive. So when you give him the carries, he has good vision, good balance, all these things. I, I think he's going to compete with Mark Ingram sooner rather than later and start eating into that touchdown. If you give a guy like Justice Hill 10 to 15 touches a game, you know, probably more realistic, realistically like 10 to 12, and then maybe that will start working its way up. Uh, I think he's going to hit a lot of home runs for you, given his speed. I think he's a really good pass catcher. And, you know, with, with Lamar Jackson under center, you saw what this team did in the offseason. They completely revamped their offense because there were, you know, reports coming out from the team that defenses were literally only eyeing in on Lamar Jackson by the end of the year. So what they did was make speed a priority. They added Justice Hill in his 4-4 speed. They added Hollywood Brown, their first round pick, their wide receiver, who we didn't actually get to see run, but most people estimated he'd be running you know, the, uh, in the 4-3s for his 40. Miles Boykin, an absolutely crazy speed, size adjusted athlete, runs a very fast 40. So they wanted to put more speed around Lamar Jackson. And obviously, you know, from a running back perspective, this is going to open up more holes because linebackers need to cover not only the quarterback uh, or not only the running back, but the quarterback as well. So with him running under center with Lamar Jackson, uh, I think his speed will finally be able to be put on display in a sense. But obviously, you know, there's not much I could really break down for Justice Hill in terms of what he's doing at camp because it's very early in the summer. But I think we're going to hear more reports about how good Justice Hill looks at practice and how explosive he looks and then his ADP will start to rise. But I think you should get him on your radar right meow. All right, so those are the two running backs that we have on the league winning upside. And I will name some honorable mentions at the end of the video, which I always like to do. We try to get down into the big facts with you know a few key core players in these videos, maybe three to five, and then hit you with some honorable mentions. I also wanna hear at the end, after I get into the honorable mentions, who you guys think I left off this list or who you guys think has league winning upside. I also wanna mention, for all the commissioners out there, if you are a commissioner of 
your fantasy football league. We actually got a really good Fade the Public show coming up this Thursday, so stay tuned for that where we're talking about um, ways to improve your league from uh, just like a league setting, scorings, our favorite, me, Animal, and Snacks' favorite league settings and scoring settings and roster settings and things like that and, and different things that you guys should experiment with within your league, so that's going to be a really fun episode. Uh, one thing that you should absolutely do is get on teamstake.com. Teamstake.com is where you can set up basically the buy-ins for your league. It is very, 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 very simple. You literally go on teamstake.com and you enter your league. It's free of charge. You don't have to pay to sign up. You don't have to pay to use the software. Once you sign up, you literally just send your league mates a link and that's where they could pay their buy-in, right? So you don't have to wait for them to Venmo. You don't have to keep track of people who are paying you via PayPal or cash. It takes that an entire annoying process and throws it out the window. I'm the commissioner of a lot of leagues and this is like one of the, my most dreaded parts of the summer is having to collect money from everybody and then being like, oh, I have to hold on cash and then remember like, sometimes I spend that cash. I'm like, shit, I wasn't supposed to spend that. So TeamStake takes that out of it. They hold it safe, secure, and it's super, super, super customizable in terms of buy-ins, in terms of payouts. You can even have a late fee so if you want everyone to pay a week before the draft starts and they pay two days before the draft starts, you can set a dollar amount that they're going to be charged for being late and being annoying and being that guy. So teamsake.com, sign up, sign your league up, enter your buy-ins, your payouts, all those situations that you got going on. Send the link over to your friends and say, pay the damn league fees now. Teamsake.com, thank you for sponsoring today's video. Let's move over to a wide receiver on this list. And... This is more of a situation than a actual wide receiver. It was Geronimo Allison, wide receiver of the Green Bay Packers, currently going off the board around pick 100, uh, early 40s in terms of wide receiver ADP. Is Geronimo Allison a great NFL wide receiver? I don't know, probably not. But is he in the best situation that a number two wide receiver can be in? Very likely. Uh, and the reason I say a situation and not so much Geronimo Allison is because I think there's going to be a really, really tight battle between Allison and Marquez Valdez Scantling. Marquez Valdez Scantling, the sophomore wide receiver. I'm going to break down both of them a little bit and break down the situation more so, so we can really figure out why this is so valuable, other than ooh, Aaron Rodgers is quarterback, of course. So last year, Al Allison came in as arguably the number two. Randall Cobb was still there, so we were like, okay, we're not really sure who the number two is, but Allison was the number two on the outside. And Aaron Rodgers being the elite quarterback that he is, the elite actual like thrower that he is, excels throwing the ball to the outside. There are very, 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 very few quarterbacks who make their money, who make their living throwing outside the numbers because it is very hard to be accurate at that part of the field. Only the true elite throwers can do that, and Aaron Rodgers uses that to his advantage, which is why a lot of the time you see his outside receivers excel to such a high level. Jarmo Allison started the year last year, again, as the outside wide receiver too. His stat lines of the first four games, eight targets, five receptions, 69 yards, and a touchdown. We'll leave the target numbers out. So he went five for 60, 69 and one, six for 64, two for 76 and a touchdown, six for 80. So he had, he had zero games below 64 receiving yards, and he scored two touchdowns in those first four games. At that point, he was on pace for 110 targets, 76 receptions, 1,156 yards, and eight touchdowns. That's big. Those are really big numbers for a random wide receiver too, but it's not surprising because I made this chart, right? And I went back and charted all of the fantasy wide receivers in Green Bay since Aaron Rodgers has took over as the starting quarterback and their end of the year numbers. You'll see that 2013 and 2017 were emitted from the chart because Rodgers was hurt for the majority of those seasons. So we're looking at this chart and we're looking at the pace, right? These are again, the wide receiver two, the fantasy wide receiver twos in Green Bay, like 108, 72, 984, five, 68, 11, 13, four. And if you look at the numbers, they're super identical to what Allison's pace were after four games. Again, 110, 76, 11, 56, and eight. So had he, yes, it was a small sample size, but had he finished the year with those numbers, it would have been exactly in line with what Aaron Rodgers' wide receiver two normally does, right? They're almost identical at that point. The question becomes, does Allison reclaim that role in the offense? Because after week four, he suffered a concussion in week four, as well as like he irritated a, a hamstring injury, which led him to missing weeks five, six, and seven. He returned in week eight and was splitting snaps with MVS on a 50-50 snap split basis. 
Um, after that game, he injured his groin in the following week of practice, which was probably caused by rushing him back from his hamstring injury too quickly. He ended up needing core muscle surgery, which put him on the IR. Problem with Allison missing time throughout the year, right? After such a strong start, if you miss time in a with a depth chart that was like the Packers, which was such so up for grabs, when you come back, it's likely that someone closed the door on your opportunity. So whereas if Devonta Adams got hurt, right, and missed three or four weeks, you know that he's stepping right back into that wide receiver one role. But when it's a murky backfield and this or, or murky depth chart, this happens with running backs. We see it all the time. This happens with wide receivers. If you miss time and it's crowded and there's not a big gap between who's playing wide receiver two, three, four, whatever, there's a good chance that when you do come back, you're going to be splitting snaps and you don't return to that exact role. Uh, and that was a problem I saw with Allison. But it's like, how does Green Bay feel about Allison right now? I mean, he was a, a free agent this offseason. He could have went, went elsewhere. They tendered him. And then other teams came in and tried to sign him. They had interest. And then Green Bay ended up signing him for more money than the original tender. It, it's nothing crazy. I think it was one year, $2.8 million. But it also tells you that, you know, they could have let him walk and let another team pay him more money. But they were interested in re-signing him. So, they signed Allison back, tells you that they are, you know, interested in him. They saw him be productive on the field as that wide receiver too. Now, literally reports came out like this morning about Marquez Valdez-Scantling operating as the wide receiver too. And we're also seeing a lot of reports about like, I, I've seen reports about almost every single one of these wide receivers are going to be playing more in the slot, right? I've heard about Devontae Adams. I've heard about Jerome Allison. I've heard about Marquez Valdez-Scantling. So it's like all these reports about who's wide receiver too, who's going to be playing in the slot, it's all up for debate pretty much at this point. The other thing to note, though, about this Green Bay offense is they have three wide receivers on the field a very, very high percentage of the time. Only the Rams, I think, had more plays last year with three wide receivers. I'm on sharpfootballstats.com, and this is the hands down the best website if you're looking for like in-depth uh, tendencies and stuff for NFL teams. Um, sharpfootballstats.com has like all of these crazy in-depth numbers. Green Bay ran 783 offensive plays last year from three wide receiver sets, which was the second highest number. So they have the second most snaps from three wide receiver sets. Only the Rams had them. Rams ran it at a not, uh, above a 90% clip. So um, even if, you know, Allison is subjugated to slot duties, right? He's still going to be on the field as much as like most wide receivers in the NFL. And I think Allison is someone that will benefit the most out of any of these guys from being in the slot because Demonte Adams can win outside outright. You look at Marquez Valdez-Scantling and he is a much better prospect than John Allison coming out in terms of athleticism and speed and, and combination of that with size. So he's a better outside prospect. So John Allison is, is the one out of these three that lacks athleticism and they're best in the slot. Those are the guys that we could see the long I talk about this all the time. The long slot receivers that aren't necessarily fast or quick, right? Adam Thielen, Juju Smith-Schuster, Tyler Boyd, um, Michael Thomas, even though he's very fast, but you get the point. Those are the guys that excel when put into the slot. So if there's anyone that can benefit from being put in the slot out of these guys, it is absolutely Geronimo Allison. Again, though, I, I reiterate, this is more making sure you're keeping an eye on the situation because whoever emerges as the wide receiver too, and it might be smart to just take the cheapest of the two because I'm assuming MVS is going around pick I don't know, like 140 right now. What scares me about MVS is the reports all sound good, right? And he has a lot in his favor. But we saw Allison have the role, do really well, and then get hurt. And then we saw MVS pick up the role, play okay, play pretty good. He had a couple good games, and then fall off like the face of the earth. Starting in week 10, the last seven or eight games of the season, these are his yardage totals. MVS, when Allison was out. 44, 8, 3, 19, 19, 12, 75, 43. So he had a five game stretch where he went under 50 receiving yards and he was an 85 to 90% snap player during the majority of that span, right? So we saw Allison do really well in the role and then we saw MVS get the role and not do so well for a long period of time. So I wanna see that consistency and a lot of that maybe can be chalked up to the fact that, you know, he's a rookie, right? And there are going to be ups and downs. And it was like a fluid situation where people were getting hurt, people inside and outside of the lineup. And he was moving around the positions a lot, you know, between slot and outside receiver. So we'll have to see exactly what happens here. So that's a little bit of a cause for concern. And you also look at like, I know Allison's been in the, in the league for three years already. Last year was MVS's rookie year. But Allison is only about a half a year older than MVS is. So when you're looking at it that way, it's like, it kind of puts things in perspective. MBS came out as a very, very 
um, old prospect. So when you're coming in as an old prospect, you should be able to produce right away, right? Because you're 23, 24, you should have that route running down. You should have the technique down, right? And, th- and, and that's why like the late breakout age is a concern a lot of the times for college prospects. Because at that point, you better be good by the time you hit the NFL because you've had two, three years on these younger guys. But as I said, a lot of the reports coming out of Green Bay camp, especially straight from the Hefe's mouth, Aaron Rodgers is talking about how good MBS looks. He should be a three down player, um, which is good to hear because Aaron Rodgers, you know, always touts players. And a lot of times the coaching staff does not put them in. But we have a new coaching staff here. And maybe they'll listen to Aaron Rodgers. And he doesn't give out praise off. I mean, he actually likes a lot of guys, but he's not afraid to say when some guys need to step up. So it's good to hear that he's liking what he's seeing out of MBS so far. So we look at it, we break it down. Allison has not been able to play a full 16 games yet. He has not proved durability. Um, But you look at MVS, he has not proved consistency. As you see, the entire second half of the year last year, he didn't do shit. And I know other people will be like, yeah, Equinemius St. Brown is a fun name to throw around, but he's the wide receiver four, if that right now. Jay Kumro is another one that receives a lot of buzz. But, I mean, how much production can you really expect out of either of those guys? Right now, I think the clear starting depth chart is Adams, Allison, slash MVS, the, the top three guys. I ultimately think that Allison will win the wide receiver two role in the offense because he's already done that and he didn't disappoint when he was out there. So as outlandish as those numbers were, his pace, it's not that crazy. And I think those numbers are up for the taking in Green Bay and someone will probably end the season with around those numbers, right? 60, 70 catches, around 1,000 yards, seven, eight touchdowns. And that's the great part about playing with Rodgers is last year he, he threw 25 touchdowns, two interceptions, crazy touchdown interception ratio. And he had a career low in touchdown rate, right? This is something that we always talk about in terms of predicting quarterbacks and how many touchdowns they're going to throw in the previous year or the following year or whatever. We look at their career touchdown rate, the percentage of throws that go for touchdowns. Last year, he was at 4.2%. The last 10 years in Green Bay as a starter, his career average was 6.5%. So we saw in terms of the volume of his passing and then the amount of touchdowns he produced was at a monster career low. So I'm fully expecting Aaron Rodgers, if he gets back to... Um, his 6.5 average or even like 6.0, his touchdown total is going to be around 36 to 38, which is what you normally expect from Rodgers. And I think whoever the wide receiver two is here is going to eat because Jimmy Graham sucks and they don't have anyone behind them. So of course there is risk with Allison because MBS might steal the job and vice versa, but keep an eye on the situation because there's absolutely breakout potential for the taking here. All right, let's talk about a pass catcher. Before we do though, if you're enjoying make sure you hit that subscribe button down below and join us for the rest of the videos that we put out this summer. Hit that thumbs up button also if you're enjoying. Um, And again, subscribe to the podcast and leave a rating and review, please. Draft guide entrance or or not, I would appreciate it because obviously I put a lot of time and work into these videos. We're going to talk about Dak Prescott, quarterback for the Dallas Cowboys, currently going off the board 130th overall, quarterback 16. In his three NFL seasons, Dak has finished as the fantasy quarterback 6, 9, and 12. He's been very, very, very quietly good for fantasy football. Like league winning good? No, definitely not. But that's because he hasn't shown the weekly consistency or the upside for that to be the case until last year. And more specifically, when Amari Cooper came over from Oakland. Then things changed in a major way. But we look at the the Dallas Cowboys offense overall. Last year, they threw the ball on nearly 57% of their plays, which was uh, almost a 5% jump from the year prior when they were at 52%, and that ranked 30th in the NFL in terms of passing rate. The year prior, they were dead last in the NFL, throwing the ball on 51.3% of their plays. So a 5% increase, I think, kind of shows you where they are going with this offense. Through the first seven games of their season, before Amari Cooper was on the field, Dak attempted 29 pass attempts per game. He went over 30 pass attempts just twice in those seven games, From that point forward, from weeks 9 through 17, when Cooper was finally on the field, Dak averaged 35.6 passes a game, which is an increase of more than six pass attempts per game, including a game with a career-high four passing touchdowns and a separate game with a career-high 455 passing yards. Prior to Cooper coming over, Dak had never eclipsed 332 passing yards in a single game, So not only did he hit 455 last year in that 10-week span, he also had another game of 387. So his two career highs in passing yards 
Both came in that stretch when Cooper came over. The only quarterbacks that were better than Dak Prescott in fantasy once Cooper showed up were Big Ben, Mahomes, and Matt Ryan. So Dak changed, and so did this entire offense for the much better. And I think riding that mojo from the end of last year into 2019, we have a new offense coordinator, Kellen Moore, taking over, who is a former quarterback. This is still going to be a, a run-first team, no doubt about it. They're going to ride Zeke till the wheels fall off. But I think they're going to pass the ball at a much higher percentage. They're going to be, again, around that 57 to 58%, I think. Um, even more so, maybe, because the second half of the year, they were much higher than that rate. They were uh, above 60 for sure and probably in the middle of the pack, if not upper percentage of the pack in the league. So what will it take for Dak to be a league winner? Like, yeah, I didn't I didn't just put that title for clickbait, right? There's not many times that a quarterback is going to be a, a league winning quarterback. If you're playing in a one quarterback league, I don't even know if there is such thing as a league winning quarterback at the position. Like you need to be top three at the position in order to, you know, supplement your team into the playoffs and then ride that guy throughout the playoffs. And even like top three isn't really league winning. I mean, you need to be Patrick Mahomes last year, literally and even that, like, isn't isn't league winning. Like, I lost in the playoffs with Patrick Mahomes. In my, the only one quarterback league I play in, I had Patrick Mahomes as my quarterback. Lost in the playoffs. So, like, literally, fucking, he had the best fantasy season of all time, and it didn't matter. Quarterbacks don't matter in fantasy football. So change your damn leagues to Superflex. Anyways, I think we need Dak to be a top three quarterback this year in order for him to really, really impact your team and be a league winner in the late rounds. So what I did was I wanted to look back over the last five years and see... How much rushing impacted quarterbacks? And, you know, the, the top three guys, how involved on the ground were they? So over the last five years, I looked at the top three quarterbacks, fantasy quarterbacks of each year. So obviously it's 15, five times three. Nine of them, 60% of them had at least three rushing touchdowns. And the average was 4.5. Of the remaining six that didn't have at least three rushing touchdowns, four of them rushed for at least 265 yards that season. So only two total of those 15 top three quarterbacks over the last five years didn't have at least three rushing touchdowns or 265 plus rushing yards. So I think when you're looking at top three guys, yes, there are going to be guys that get in there strictly off their passing, but as you can see, it's very, very limited. Um, and even the ones who get in like the Matt Ryans or, or, you know, those guys that, that rely heavily on their passing and they're throwing a lot of those guys luckily had two or three or even four rushing touchdowns on the ground and those are fluky for guys that don't run the ball often so you're not ever going to be able to predict that anyways if, if Dak can you know put up those numbers he's he's rushed for six rushing touchdowns in all three seasons he's been in the NFL so far if he could put up 300 rushing yards and four to five rushing touchdowns all he has to do is throw for a little bit over 4,000 yards between, you know, 25 to 28 passing touchdowns, which if you look at the pace of the second half of the year with Mark Cooper, that's exactly where he was. So I, I absolutely think there's a realistic chance. Am I, am I betting on it? Probably not, but there's a very realistic chance that Dak finishes as a top five, top three quarterback um, if he does what he did over the second half of the year, which I don't think is out of the, the realm of possibilities whatsoever. Let's get to my last player on this list before we get to honorable mentions. The tight end, Dallas Goddard, Dallas Goddard, tight end, Philadelphia Eagles. The backup tight end, apparently. Currently being picked 134th overall, tight end 16. This is a guy who is simply just hashtag good at football. I know it. You know it. The Eagles know it. The NFL knows it. There is no chance that he doesn't get more snaps this year. And I think we even started to see that towards the end of the year last year, looking at the last six weeks of the season, his snaps went up from, you know, 41.8% from weeks one to 11, weeks 12 to 17, final six games of the year, huge increase, 16% increase. He was up to 58% of the snaps. That 58% snap rate that we saw over the last month and a half of the season was around the same exact rate as Vance McDonald, Eric Ebron, OJ Howard when he was on the field, Chris Herndon last year. Like, these are legitimate starters for their teams who put up good numbers, and Dallas Goddard can absolutely do that. To me, Goddard's almost the Latavius Murray of tight ends when it comes to fantasy, right? I think not only does Goddard have um, standalone value because he is such a good red zone weapon, but obviously if Ertz goes down, Goddard becomes pretty much a league winner at the tight end position. Uh, he's going to be super involved in the red zone and inside the 10 zone next year, and I think he's going to have a bunch of uh, touchdowns, right? He had four touchdowns as a rookie tight end. It's very hard to produce as a rookie tight end. He had four while playing on 40% of the snaps overall. That was his overall snap percentage was around 40 to 42% for the entire year. Ertz had the single most red zone targets 
of any tight end in the NFL last year. 27 red zone targets. Fourth most of any player in the NFL. So when you're looking at Ertz, ridiculous number of red zone targets. If Goddard's on the field a little bit more, we're going to see some of those go over to him. And I think he's just too good not to come away with a, a, a high number of surpri- a surprisingly high number of touchdowns. So again, like Latavius Murray, I wouldn't be surprised if Goddard finished the year with somewhere between six and eight touchdowns. And you know what happens if a tight end scores six to eight touchdowns? He's giving you six to eight tight end one weeks. That's all it takes to be a tight end one in fantasy on a weekly basis. You also look at the Eagles offense, right? And why, why do we think Goddard's going to be on the field more? They ran out of the 12 personnel. 12 personnel is two tight ends on the field. On 377 snaps last year, which was the second most snaps in the entire NFL. And when you're looking at neutral game scripts, right? That's another thing you could do on sharpfootballstats.com. Neutral game scripts, meaning um, within seven points, either leading or trailing, which is, you know, where you basically show your cards. They were by far and away the number one team in terms of plays from the 12 personnel. So despite being the backup, Goddard has an actual legitimate uh, snap floor. You know, and like I said, it was the same percentage he had last year down the stretch as the guys like Vance, Ebron, whatever. So if we see that, if we so see what we saw over the, the, the last six weeks of the season coming into 2019, we're going to see Goddard be a staple of this offense. Um, and he should be because he's such a good weapon. So again, I wouldn't be surprised if he scores seven to eight touchdowns this year. Um, and he is a legit tight end handcuff. There are not many tight end handcuffs in the NFL, but he is one of them. This is a a position that historically is one of the most injury prone positions in the league. I know Ertz has shown stability over his career. He played all 16 games last year, but the two seasons prior to that, 2017, 2016, uh, he missed multiple games in both of those years. So even if you have Goddard for three games, right, without Ertz this year, you're getting three high end elite tight end games. If it's a more serious injury, you really have a league winner there in Goddard. And I also think he's going to be able to give you weekly games where if he scores a touchdown, He's within the top 10 fantasy tight ends on those given weeks. So those are my late round league winning upside guys. Um, And I want to hear who you guys think I left off the list. Some honorable mentions will be Lamar Jackson, Kyler Murray, even though Kyler Murray is rapidly rising up the ADP lists. And it's kind of for the same reason as I had Dak up here. Um, I don't think Lamar Jackson is really going to get to the point where He's going to throw for 4,000 yards, so it's going to, he's going to be needing to obviously have a ridiculous rushing um, total at the end of the year, which isn't outlandish. Kyler, I think, will be able to put up numbers both in the rushing and passing categories. So I think he has legitimate like league-winning upside, almost you know Cam Newton's rookie year, right, where he was a number four, number three quarterback, and obviously helped you know boost you to the playoffs in your league that year, probably. Um, I like Mark Andrews, another sophomore tight end as a very sneaky good play um super athletic took over the tight end one role there and had good connection with lamar jackson christian kirk uh, is probably going a little bit too early in drafts for me to say he's like a late round pick i think he will continue to creep up but i think he's still around pick 90 right now so christian kirk is one of my absolute favorite breakout candidates this year same with anthony miller finally healthy off the shoulder injury off the shoulder surgery scored seven touchdowns his rookie year he's just got a knack for the end zone and i wouldn't be surprised if he hits eight to ten touchdowns this year kiki qt Love that motherfucker. If something happens to Will Fuller, not outlandish, Kiki QT is going to see 110 to 120 targets. Um, I think he's going to be a beast this year. I'm really excited to see what QT does there in Houston. And those are pretty much my honorable mentions. So again, guys, if you enjoy the video, make sure you hit that thumbs up button. Make sure you subscribe to the channel if you are new. We're doing videos like this literally five days a week. And go check out teamsteak.com. The link will be down below. Get your league on Teamsteak. Don't worry about buy-ins ever again. If you're a good friend to your commissioner, help him out. Let him know about Team Steak if he doesn't watch my videos. I know you don't. a lot of people are like, I don't want to tell my friends about your channel. You know what? It's a, an occupational hazard when you're in the business like this. Tell them about Team Steak, though. You don't got to tell them about my channel. I don't care. Win your league. Don't tell your friends about me. But that's all I got for today. Make sure you enter the draft guide giveaway. Rating, review, screenshot on iTunes. I'm out. I love y'all. Peace.